and here. All right, looks like we are going live on Facebook now. And we do have some folks on the conference call, several joining us this morning. And we'll give it just a minute for those who are on Facebook to join in. Those on the conference call, as a reminder, put yourself on mute uh, so you can hear me, but we can uh, eliminate the background noise as you mute your lines. I do see several there who are already joining in. Hey, good morning, Bradley. Uh, Jerry Ann there, good morning. And we have several on the conference call as well. Uh, Brother Norman, good morning. <coughs> Bonnie Jones, Keith, hey. Jim is with Bonnie as well. That's a good thing. <laughs> All right. Betty, good morning. Beverly, good morning. Barbara, good morning. All right, lots of folks joining on Facebook. And Nancy is there on as well. Good morning. And we have a lot on the conference call this morning as well. I told the conference call folks they would be our amen corner this morning. <laughs> hey, and good morning, Peggy. Uh, several joining in as we uh, start to go live this morning. Chip and Julie, hey, good morning. Glad you all are on. All right, this morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 1. I'll give you a moment to uh, turn there, or if you're looking at your Bible electronically, to scroll there with your electronic device. And we'll be uh, looking at Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 20. I love to study prophetic books, and I love the opportunity that we have to start to uh, dive in. Hey, good morning, Ralph. And to dive into those so that we can glean all the truths that there are. You know, there's so many times that people are afraid of prophetic books because they, they use a lot of imagery and they use a lot of forward ideas. And it's very difficult sometimes to even understand uh, the, the frame of reference from which they're coming. But one of the biggest things that we can realize as we start to get into Isaiah and even when we study other prophetic books is this. God has a message of hope for you in prophecy. Yes, it can be scary. And yes, there can be uh, situations and items in those that may cause you, hey, Leanne and Wren, uh, that can cause you to even shake in your shoes a little bit as you read them. But the number one thing we can realize is there is hope in prophecy. And that hope is a blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we start in to Isaiah, Isaiah has an important message for us right from the get-go. And that is, it is important for us as children of God to be and behave as true believers. You know, in our lives each day, paying bills, going to the grocery store, getting our car serviced, our days are filled with mundane tasks that become routine and often even put us on autopilot. Well, sometimes even church and our personal devotion times can fall into these repetitive ruts as well, where we start to go through the motions. Even relationships can become stale and fade into the background, into the background of our daily routines and the ruts that we sometimes get into. And good morning, Pat. I'm sure Dudley's with you as well. And we're, we'll say, Pat, we're praying for you and your family uh, this morning. Her mother had her home going. And so uh, we're praying for y'all as you uh, go through that. We love y'all. I'm praying for you. Uh, sometimes even our church and devotions then can fall into these repetitive ruts as well. And relationships can. And this is especially dangerous when our relationship, our fellowship with our Heavenly Father can also be suffering from this idea of being in a routine or a rut. To give us the context from Isaiah 1 to chapter 4, many of the prophetic books in the Old Testament start by introducing the prophet and the prophet's call into ministry. But the book of Isaiah starts a little differently than that. The first few notes of Isaiah gives a vision from God in the first few verses. And verse 2 launches immediately then into a condemnation of God's people. And the call of Isaiah to prophetic ministry doesn't even show up until later on in chapter 6. 
This arrangement then leads to almost a shock as you read it in comparison to other prophetic books. The, the reader is blasted with, with, this higher, with this fiery anger that comes from the prophetic vision that God has, uh, even against his own people here. And Isaiah puts this condemnation in the form of a covenant lawsuit, a term that might need a little bit of explanation here because a covenant is something more than just a contract. It's something more than just a promise between people. A covenant, the closest thing that we have with that with a covenant in today's society is a marriage covenant. Because there's something that comes along with a covenant that you don't get in a contract, and that is this idea of relationship. So when we think about a covenant between God and his people, we're talking about not only some type of a, a legal contractual agreement between two people, but a legal contractual agreement between two people that involves a relationship between those parties, a close and personal relationship. So Isaiah takes on the role of a prosecuting attorney, as so often uh, prophets in the Old Testament did. And this role was common for them, but it was not the only role of prophets. Prophets also brought hope, and they also brought comfort. They represented the people's case to God and they sought to change the hearts of the people so that the covenant relationship between God and his people could be restored and the legal case against them would be dropped. Even in Isaiah 1, 16 through 20 talks about that. Kathy and Otis piped in there and David and Wanda as well. Good morning, y'all. In other words, Isaiah not only condemned the hearts and the behavior of the people, he also promised them hope for the future. Even if the nation did not repent and face the resulting judgment, the faithful among God's people could still find hope in the promise that God would one day restore his nation. They would be a beacon to the other nations of the world. That brings us hope today as Christians that we should be true believers even if our entire nation turns away from God. Even if the entire nation turns away from God and falls, we can still find hope as a true faithful remnant that God can use us to create a new nation, a nation that would follow him and that would represent him to all the people of the world. It was this same kind of hope that Isaiah offered the people of Israel. The immediate problem that we have here with the people in this passage from Isaiah 1 is there, it seems that they had a complete lack of understanding. It seemed they did not know what God wanted. And in fact, they did not really know God. According to Isaiah, as we'll see as we study this morning, animals had a better understanding of their relationship with their owners than God's people had of their relationship with God. We'll see that, and if you look back at Isaiah 1-3, you can see that. The people had come to view God as a kind of a sort of a vending machine, an impersonal dispenser of favors in return for sacrifices and offerings. And they, they thought that the more they went to the church, the temple there, and the more they worshiped and the more they did those things, that God would return favors to them. So they weren't doing it because of their love for him. They weren't going and worshiping because they had a close relationship and fellowship with him. They were going because they expected to get something out of it. God was like a vending machine to them. Even if judgment comes, we find the faithful remnant can have hope for the future. So let's go into Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 15 and see the first condemnation of that. And the first condemnation is this, empty expressions. Empty expressions. Let's look at Isaiah 1, starting with chapter 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now he's talking to the people of Israel here. Okay, so we'll go back to that. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are all your sacrifices to me? Asked the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, or male goats. This phrase, hear the word of the Lord here, would bring two things to mind 
for Isaiah's audience first, it points them to the prophet's authority. Because Isaiah was not simply speaking as a man. And he was not speaking simply about the things that he viewed as being wrong in society. He was conveying the very words of God. And secondly, this word here would bring to mind the, 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 uh, the passage in Deuteronomy 6.4 that says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is a very important passage to the Israelites. It reflected to them that God was consistent in the way that he dealt with Israel. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today. He's the same as he was tomorrow. God will never change and his word will never fade away. He had saved the people of Israel from Egypt and he had even brought them through the wilderness. So God had a right to command them in the way that they should live. Then the word that he uses there also in that verse is the word instruction. That brings back the idea of, of God's Torah or of God's law. So verse 10 told the audience that Isaiah was speaking God's words. In Hebrew, the word translated here also implies obedience. We relate this to thinking about the way that we tell children maybe to clean their room. If the room remains unclean, we question whether or not the child actually hurt us because they did not obey us. Well, if it's the same way with hearing God's words. Hearing God's commands, it's not enough. Obedience follows the commands if the words are truly heard. The rulers of the people are compared to the rulers of Sodom. That's interesting, isn't it? He starts out by telling the rulers that they're the rulers of Sodom and by telling the people that they're the people of Gomorrah. And he, he compares them to that. Genesis 19 tells us a lot about Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sure many of you remember that story. The sins of these cities were many, and their citizens were interested only in their own pleasure and their own needs. Their sins were many. We know about uh, the primary sins. That's where we get the word sodomy. But there were also other sins of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah as well. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50 sheds a light on what these sins are. Listen to this, Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Now this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. He's going to give us more things beyond the sins that we typically associate with Sodom and Gomorrah, sodomy. She and her daughters, that is citizens, had pride, plenty of food, and comfortable security but did not support the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable acts before me. So I removed them when I saw this. They were so proud of their sin, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah did, they were so proud of it that the men of the city came out and demanded Lot to bring out the angel who were in his home so they could have sexual relations with them. It was no doubt shocking to Isaiah's audience to hear that they were as bad as these cities that were destroyed by fire from heaven. The people of God, see, had become prideful. They had rejected God in just about every way possible. The rulers had led the people astray, but the people had willingly cooperated in choosing sin and in rejecting the loving God who had brought them out of Egypt. God asked the people a, a very serious question. What are all your sacrifices to me? That tells us that they had not stopped worshiping God in the most literal sense and in the ways that were prescribed. They were still bringing sacrifices to the temple. And these sacrifices and offerings would have been the ones that were outlined in Leviticus 1 through 7. Not all the sacrifices were for sin or guilt. Some of the sacrifices were meant to express thankfulness. There were thank offerings, while others were meant to be part of a meal that were shared in the presence of God. Those were fellowship offerings. The problem was that people uh, of God, they had lost sight of the purpose behind the sacrifices. And that purpose was this, a relationship and close fellowship with God. 
but rather than loving God and bringing sacrifices and offerings to show him their love, the people were engaging in empty rituals, or worse, they were viewing their offerings as a means to get what they wanted. <coughs> Verse 11 hints at the emptiness of their rituals. God says, I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams. I have no desire for the blood of bulls. This statement would have shocked the audience just as much as the earlier comparison to Sodom and Gomorrah. With our modern ideas and life on this side of the cross, such a rejection of the sacrificial ritual makes sense. But for Isaiah's readers, this statement would have been confusing to them at the very least. Hadn't God commanded these offerings and sacrifices? If so, then why would he no longer want them? After all, the types of sacrifices that were described in these verses are the very best of the best, good and costly gifts that they were faithfully bringing before God. How then could God be disappointed in the quality, in the, in the, the sacrifices that they were bringing to the temple? Well, God was disappointed because he knew the motives of their hearts. It's, a, it's an important reminder for us that God views and he knows the motives of our hearts. When we bring sacrifices to him, when we give our tithe and offering, when we sing songs to him, when we serve others, are we doing it out of love for him or are we doing it so that we'll be seen of others? Let's look now at verses 12 through 14. In verse 12, he says, When you come to appear before me, who requires this from you, this trampling of my courts, stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of solemn assemblies. I cannot stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They have become a burden to me. I am tired of of putting up with them, he says. He asks a question that I'm sure would be puzzling to them, no doubt, because he says, who requires this from you, this trampling of my courts? In other words, in other words God is saying, who commanded you to consistently offer sacrifices in the temple in the first place? Well, a quick review of Leviticus gives us the answer. It was God himself. Why then is God saying that he no longer wanted these sacrifices? And why is he saying that they're trampling his courts? The quality of the gifts they were bringing was not in question, but the motivation behind the giving was in question. The people were to obey and to love God, and going through the motions was not enough. Repetitive sacrificial activity, that is, trampling out God's courts, Without love for God is an empty affair. In God's eyes, it was meaningless. The people might as well not offer sacrifices at all as to come in and trample his courts while really not loving God because doing so was an insult to him. Just in case the listeners had missed the meaning of how unwelcome their sacrifices were, he goes further, and the Lord makes it clear with the phrase, Stop bringing useless offerings. The offerings were useless because in and of themselves they did not accomplish anything. Anything at all. The Israelites thought that the offerings appeased God and earned them his blessings. The idea of trading offerings and sacrifices for the blessing and protection of a God was prevalent among the people of, that surrounded the nation of Israel. Those people who were idolatrous and served other gods would say that you don't receive blessing because you didn't give to this God in a right way, or you didn't serve this God on a right day, or you didn't give this God the right thing, or you didn't say the right thing. And so the Israelites were bringing in these pagan ideas that if you want to receive blessing from God, then you need to give something to God in a way that is pleasing to him so that you can get something back. Not because you're doing it because you love him or you want to serve him or you want to bring glory to him, but simply because he's like a vending machine. 
put in your change and you put in just the right amount of change and you can get out that Snickers bar or whatever it is that you're trying to get out of that vending machine. That was the idea that they had in serving God in these ways. They were doing it to get something out of it, not because they loved him. And the Lord goes on and says, I hate your new moons and your prescribed festivals. The new moon festivals were celebrated at the beginning of each month. This was because Judah operated on a lunar calendar instead of a solar calendar. So the new moon marked the beginning of each month. Numbers 28, 11 through 15 explains what offerings to, were to be brought in the celebration of the new moon. And the festival marked God's lordship over time and was intended to remind the Israelites of his gift of life to them. Yet their celebrations had become worthless because the people only did them for the blessings they thought they would get. Keith says this is related to our time. It is, brother. I appreciate that. Yes, so much. Likewise, he mentions the Sabbaths. The celebration of the Sabbath was a favorite test case for many of the prophets. This is because observing the Sabbath demonstrated trust in God. We see this in the, uh, the account that was given in God's providing the people manna when they were out in the wilderness. They were told not to gather more manna than they needed for each day. And that was an object lesson to them that God provides them what they need for each day. When is the last time that you had to rely upon God for the needs of that day? <laughs> we should rely upon him for the needs of every day and get up and say, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving me what I need today. May I use it to glorify you. How can I serve you with this new day that you've given me? God chastened the people because they weren't supposed to gather on the Sabbath. Instead, they were supposed to gather extra so they wouldn't have to gather on the Sabbath. But still, some people did it anyway. And their manna would be ruined in so doing. They weren't trusting God. They weren't trusting him to provide what they needed. And they misused the Sabbath. Let's look at verse 15 in Isaiah chapter 1. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands, he said, are covered with blood. This phrase, spread out your hands in prayer, indicates this idea of supplication. It, the supplication is a posture that's used when somebody was praying in an intense want or need for something to that God would take care of. When we talk about supplication, we are pleading to God for something that is God-sized. Well, Isaiah's audience undoubtedly expected that their requests would be granted given how many offerings and sacrifices that they were bringing to the temple. What a surprise they must have gotten as they listened to Isaiah. And he said, God is telling you, I will refuse to look at you. Looking at someone implies that you have their attention. In Hebrew thought, to be in someone's presence and good graces was expressed as having them to face you. If you lost graces with someone or they didn't want to have anything to do with you anymore, they would turn their back on you and they would not face you any longer. God's saying this, I, I, I refuse to look at you. I'm go not going to look at you. I'm not going to listen to your prayers because your hands are covered with blood. What a wild thing that he would say there. Your hands are covered with blood. This language represents violence toward each other and toward the innocent in Israel. Shades of Sodom and Gomorrah once again appear as the injustices of the people toward others start to come into view. As evident in chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, the people were acting much like the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Israelites did not expect this to matter to God as long as they made the appropriate sacrifices and offerings to him in the temple. But Isaiah showed them just how wrong they were. I'm reminded 
of a scripture that says to us that if we know the truth to show someone the way and we do not do it, their blood is on our hands. That speaks a lot to us, doesn't it? James said, if you know the good that you're supposed to do and you don't do it, that to you is sin. These people had blood on their hands instead of blood on the altar as was prescribed by God because they were living in disobedience and using their worship and their offerings and their sacrifices as a mask for the wickedness and the darkness that was in their hearts. Next, we see the Bible talking about pure pursuits. Isaiah chapter 1, let's look at verses 16 through 17. He says, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. There's a lot in this verse. Verse 16 gives four commands. Wash, cleanse, remove, and stop. For Isaiah's audience, washing was more than physically bathing because in the context of worship, this word implies the ritual bath that was done as part of the preparation before people would even enter into the Lord's presence. Leviticus talks about these ritual baths and how they would wash their hands certain ways and wash themselves in certain ways before they would even go in and minister before God in the temple. Similarly, cleansing oneself meant putting away all sources of ritual impurity. So when we think about the context of this passage here in verses 16 and 17, this idea of washing, cleansing, implies not just a ritual outward cleansing, but an internal cleansing. That's the kind that really matters. This internal aspect is confirmed by the commands next that say to remove evil deeds and to stop doing evil. You know, sometimes we hear people say, well, I can't help it, I'm just human. Or, I couldn't help it, the devil made me do it. You know, the Bible teaches us that that is very false. Both of those statements are false. We engage in evil activities and we engage in sin when we choose of our own free will to do them. Well, God says, stop your evil deeds, remove them from yourself, and stop doing evil. Then he goes on with positive commands after that. He tells us what to do. Now he's going to go on with positive commands. Learn, pursue, correct, defend, and plead. This first command he gives us is learn to do what is good. This gives us the question of how the Israelites were to learn what to do good. How would you do that? Well, you have godly people around you and you have godly pursuits within you by studying the word of God and by spending quality time with him each day. Day. Then he talks about pursuing justice. That is to correct the blocking of justice, to defend and to advocate for those who are less fortunate than ourselves, and to pull those people up as much as we can so that we can minister to him, to them in ways that would bring glory to God. Well, next we see in Isaiah 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, as we wrap up today, repentance is required. In verse 18, he says, come, let us settle this, says the Lord. Some translations say, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. That implies communication, doesn't it? Communicating with him, listening to him talk back to you through his word. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Hallelujah. Though they be crimson red, they will be like wool. Amen. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. This phrase, come, let us settle this, come, let us reason together, carries the idea of setting things right and bringing to an end a quarrel. Isaiah let the people know that they could avoid the fate that befell Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's where the hope comes in. They had a chance to repent, yet there was much more here than just the call to repentance. The two major issues that Isaiah pointed out to the people were their lack of obedience and the connected theme of their, their inability to be aware of who God is 
and what he desires. So rather than let the Israelites continue in their ignorance of him, the Lord wanted to communicate with his people. He wanted to have fellowship with them. He wanted more than empty ritual. And he wants more than empty ritual than you and me today. While God was rejecting ritual without relationship, he was not rejecting ritual and sacrifice altogether. This is evident in the next two phrases. He said, even though their sins were scarlet and crimson red, they could become white as snow and wool. Such a transformation involves sacrifice and the spilling of blood. And thanks be to God that we have seen that through the sacrifice that was given by Jesus Christ on the cross for you and me today. So that we know in today's church, we don't have to go and sacrifice animals anymore and spill their blood because our sins have been washed away when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his blood has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. He says in verse 20, if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The only other option for the Israelites was continued disobedience would ultimately result in death. So as they continued in their disobedience, they would meet disaster. The Bible gives only two choices for our lives. The first is to submit to God, which leads to life. And the second is to refuse and rebel, which leads to death. There was no middle ground for Israel. There was no middle ground for Judah. And there's no middle ground for us in terms of our response to God. For Isaiah's audience, the punishment of God would come by the sword. For the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah will both be destroyed by invading nations. And that's what we, looking back on it, we can see it now. Isaiah looking forward could see it coming. Israel fell to the Assyrians and Judah fell to the Babylonians. And in both cases, these foreign nations were the sword in God's hand as he brought punishment on his people. Isaiah closed this section with the phrase, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These words demonstrate that what Isaiah had said was the authority of God, and it also closed the debate. There was no more negotiation at this point. All that was left was for the people of God to either listen and obey or to continue in their rebellion. The choice was theirs, and the choice is ours. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. It's to know that what you're doing is wrong and to stop doing it. That is a true heart of repentance, to wash ourselves and to cleanse ourselves and to make every effort to purge sin from our lives so that we might have a close fellowship with him. Be a true believer, one who pleases God in life and in worship. Avoid empty expressions through religious rituals that cover up a heart of unrepentance and instead engage in pure pursuits by washing and cleansing your heart and mind of evil thoughts and deeds through confession and repentance to God and by engaging in real and active ministries toward orphans and widows and the poor and the lost so God will get the glory and so others will be pointed to him. Thank you so much for joining today. I pray the Lord will bless this word to your heart as he has to mind this week that we might be able to serve him as true believers and so that all those around us in the world today who so desperately need to see the trueness of walking in fellowship with the Lord God can see that so that Jesus will be made known to them and so that God will get the glory through our lives. And so our friends, our neighbors, our communities, and our nation will turn to God. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Don't forget to turn in, uh, tune in today at 11.
for the live stream. Pray for Sugar and Sam and the rest of the band and the media team as they lead and for Pastor Mike as he brings another word to us from the Word of God. God bless you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.